Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Take a Shot at That. I am, of course, your host, Matthew Hendershot, and joining me once again in the studio, uh, truly fulfilling, hopefully, today his role as official <laughs> Shot at That historian. Yeah, no pressure. Uh, Justin is here back in the studio with us. How you doing, Justin? I'm doing okay. My health is taking a bit of a knock, but I guess it's just the time of year when all the, the bugs and the, the illnesses start to creep up. So yeah, welcome to fall. There's been a, an interesting weather change yes, uh, in the past indeed. couple of days that has kind of... <laughs> Put yep. everybody in the different kind of exactly. Space, that's that's you know? not the cocaine either. No. That's the <laughs> <laughs> Before we dive into this, uh, uh, in keeping with our theme of bringing back the dot com, no social media plugs. Just go to shot at that dot com where you can find out everything you need to know about the podcast or patreon dot com slash shot at that if you want to support. Done. Absolutely. See how easy it is. It's this is done. Anybody can remember that. I'm ready to start drinking. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man. So, so we've upgraded. Yeah, I we're, it's no it's not a shots day. No. On the podcast today, instead uh, I used the formula that I learned and I have fashioned us some hopefully delicious gin and tonics here from the Lebsigo Spirituos and Manufacturer Ether Gin. Yeah. A couple slices of cucumber and this nice four parts Saxon Quella tonic to one part gin. So cheers, buddy. Cheers indeed. Oh my goodness. See, you know better than I do when it comes to this kind of stuff. Because to me, that tastes really good. That does taste really good. Um, but I'm not a big gin and tonic drinker. No. You, however, are much more familiar with this cocktail. This is extremely delicious. Um, because the, the flavor of the gin is still in there, even though it's been heavily diluted by tonic. So mm. we already established the last couple of weeks that the gin on its own without any additives is just extremely flavorful it's got so much in it mm -hmm. and there's always a risk of course then when you dilute it with tonic that some of that tends to disappear but actually this tonic is not too heavy so it's quite a light tonic which means that the flavor of the gin still comes through yeah um it's a very 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 easygoing lovely yeah. calm drink yeah it's it, like i said it's not a cocktail that i'm i'm super super familiar with i'm, I'm curious about making myself like a really proper like gin martini you With know get some like extra dry vermouth and, mm. and get that going and like okay. maybe even prosciutto and uh, uh parmesan cheese stuffed in an olive and dropped to the bottom and a little bit of extra olive juice and like okay. really get bougie with this gin martini and see if it you're gonna put uh, on a tux before you drink it yeah, and, i might yeah. no i mean come on the name's hendershot only only matt hendershot only after 6 p.m <laughs> <laughs> so uh again big thanks to the leipzig spirituals and manufacturer for, for supporting the show cheers guys out there your drink is delicious you can find more by going to leipzig spirituosen manufacturerde or just look for them in many shops around leipzig these days um i tell you if you do have that tuxedo wearing fancy gentleman type or fancy lady type, you know, yes. that, that likes to, you know, sit back and kick some gin or a gin and tonic or gin martini or something like that. This would probably make a pretty good Christmas present. Most certainly. Which it's, is right around the corner. Well, yes, anyway. absolutely. It's never too early to start thinking about this. Or like so. Friday present. Yeah, or, yeah, you know, you just know like, full presents. It's like or Friday, a, Friday presents, Friday right? Presents, like exactly. Friday presents yeah. should be a thing. We should all start getting our friends like Friday presents. Like, hey, it's every, Friday. Or just Here's the a first little, Friday or every yeah, just Friday. Maybe like just, every, every, every Friday, Friday and again, Friday. you know, just yeah. if you feel like it. It's okay. Give I somebody a Friday present. I think that's a good idea. A okay, bottle so of gin. A a bottle of gin is, I, I like Friday presents too. And if anyone wants to get me a bottle of the Leipzig Spirit of Rose Manufactured Gin or the Vontka, then uh, I won't say no. You'd be on board. I'd be totally on board, definitely. <laughs> good, good. So uh, this will be a, um, a fun... I'm, I've been looking forward to this episode because okay. we have something coming up that is a bit of a local and national holiday. That's right. Big historical thing that's yes. going on. And it ties into uh, some other interesting sort of current-ish events that have been happening around. So... To start, um, I cede microphone duties to you, good <laughs> sir, okay. and please take us on a history lesson and tell us about October 3rd, 1989. So, uh, 
Actually, October 3rd, 1989 is not a particularly spectacular day. It's October 3rd, 1990. That is the, 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 the day of the reunification. So uh, yes. obviously this year, uh, 2019, is the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the East German regime and the fall of the wall and the opening of the borders and all the events that preceded that. Because it, it wasn't the third. The, it was the, the ninth, the, right? the, the, major, the two major dates that are really important, I think, from a Leipzig standpoint are the 9th of October and right. the, the 9th of November. Hmm. So the 9th of October was uh, this huge demonstration that took place in Leipzig where tens of thousands of people marched along the ring and um, nobody really knew how it was going to end. So what had been happening was that every Monday in the Nikolai Kirche, uh, a small peace group had sort of been gathering uh, to do prayers, you know, peace prayers on Monday. And eventually, more and more people had started to attend that to the point that they couldn't all fit in the church. Mm. And so they started to assemble outside the church. And then, of course, the secret police got involved because they didn't want this, you know, they were spying the shit out of the guys uh, inside the church, but at least it was sort of out of sight and out of mind if it was inside the church. And Leipzig was one of the few East German cities that usually had uh, a fairly... Uh, not high number, but a regular number of foreigners, so visitors from the West there, because it was, as it is now, mm. a city of trade fairs. Mm -hmm. So you would have lots of people, foreign journalists, foreign businessmen would be in Leipzig. So obviously it was very important for the regime to try and keep this out of sight. But it just kept growing. It just kept growing. It just kept growing until they started to actually sort of move on to the ring and assemble in ever larger areas. And then also people, despite a sort of a news curfew, there was people coming into Leipzig from all over the, the country. And the big march was then going to be on the 9th of October. Mm. And um, nobody knew what was going to happen. In in uh, June of that year, there had been the Tiananmen Square uprising mm. in China, and it had been brutally suppressed by the Chinese government. And the East German leadership, some people had been sort of, you know, openly musing about maybe having a Chinese solution oh, to, the, Lord. to the, yeah. yeah. So people didn't know if the tanks were coming out. They knew that the police, extra police battalions are being drafted in. Uh, most factories, most large sort of industrial complex had it, uh, a sort of a, what might be termed as sort of paramilitary workers battalions. Mm -hmm. So okay. they could be called out and given like a nightstick and being sent out to do crowd control or civil defense and so on and so forth. These were guys. <laughs> that these seems guys, real yeah, intelligent. These yeah. guys were being drafted as well. Hospitals were putting on extra beds, you know, blood plasma was being organized. People were um, imagining it was going to be a massacre. And uh, two days earlier was the 40th anniversary of the, the GDR. So it was a big celebration. Um, all the biggies were there to, set, to, to witness that. There was parades and so on and so forth. And one of the guys who was there was Gorbachev. Mm. And it was quite sort of unnerving for the East German leadership. They, of course, only had the selected best people coming to this to this ceremony. But even the um, the the Komsomols and the and the uh, Freie Deutsche Jugend, so the, so the Communist Youth League of East Germany, were shouting Gorby's name. They were celebrating him like a rock star. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they knew what he'd been doing in Russia. They knew what he'd been doing in terms of opening things up and trying to restructure. And then basically, um, that's when the sort of famous line that Gorby apparently uttered to the East German leadership, he said, uh, you need to watch what you're doing, guys, because if you come too late, you'll be punished by life. Mm. And he'd also made it very, very clear that they were on their own with this. So they couldn't rely on Russian tanks to help them out. He mm. wasn't going to come in and help suppress any of the any kind of resistance. In another part of town, there were also anti-government protests going on, which were being brutally suppressed. So people were being beaten up and arrested on the most important day of, of East Germany, on the 40th anniversary, on their national day, which was mm -hmm. the 7th of October. So two days later, have this massive, massive demonstration in Leipzig was was a fairly substantial fuck you to the state. It's a big sort of powder keg situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they were going to walk around the ring, basically. There had been very, very clear instructions to everybody involved, please do not use violence, do not give the authorities any excuse whatsoever to um, to respond. Yeah. Um, and the uh, 
leadership in Leipzig was not so gung ho about crushing it, but they they didn't really know exactly how to deal with the situation. There had been some meetings where um, the members of the opposition had men, met with members of the city council to see if they could try and uh, find a a compromise where people could express themselves, but it wouldn't get out of hand. One of the people involved in this conversation was Kurt Mazur, who then went on to New York City to be the director there, the music okay. director. Yeah. But he was the head of the Gewandhaus here in Leipzig at the okay. time. Okay, yeah. So when they did, when the demonstration started, they started to walk around the ring. And what was really cool was the um, that there was an East German camera team that managed to get access to the roof of one of the buildings overlooking the Gödler Ring. Okay. And so when you see these pictures, these TV images of just thousands upon thousands of people marching, they are images being taken by uh, by this cameraman. Huh. And he said afterwards in an interview that the building housed a lot of Stasi officers. They, that was their home. <laughs> so while they were on the building filming down, they could look and then see on the balcony Stasi officers leaning out of their balconies watching the watching the, the, the demonstrations that went by. And it seems that what was happening was that the Leipzig leadership kept calling Berlin for guidance. What do we do? What do we do? How should we deal with the situation? They weren't getting any response. Right. So nobody was at home. And it was the point when the demonstrators sort of marched past the Stasi headquarters, which I think you know where it is, of this yeah. under Ecke. Where the, where the museum is now. Exactly. Yeah. When they marched past and nothing happened, that was the moment that everybody knew it was over. Right. That was right. The system's finished. Yeah, we did it. We walked past them. They didn't retaliate. It's Now it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. before this happens. And... Um, this was a huge thing. It was massive that Leipzig was very much the progenitor of the revolution that had been starting, you know, for, for, for a number of years to have opposition movements and the, the way that it grew. And they weren't necessarily overtly political. They were demonstrating for clean air, for example. The city was polluted to fuck back in mm. the 80s. If you look at pictures of Leipzig in the 80s, you think it's fog, but it's just heavy, heavy smog. The brown coal, these mines that we've right. now turned into lakes, everybody used that to heat their, their flats. These shitty ass cars, of course, you know these these the the plastic build a box yeah. things, and yeah. they just you know were, were pumping all kinds of crap out, and yeah, people were unfiltered diesel fumes, basically, yeah. and people were complaining about kids with respiratory problems. They were, you know, there was acid rain, you know, there was these were the things. This the 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 waterways of Leipzig must have stunk to high heaven. <sighs> And apparently somebody once told me that whenever sort of dignitaries would come to visit the city, they would just pour something like, you know, some sort of scented shit into the rivers, you oh, know, shit, like, really? like pine smell or something like that, oh. just to try and just to try and it must have really, really been uh, an open sewer. The, these lovely waterways that we see now um, must have really, really been quite very, very unpleasant. So people were protesting that. They were protesting about living conditions. They were protesting about the environment. That was a big concern of theirs. And they were also protesting about the fact that there had been local elections held in May of that year, and the the, the major party got ninety nine point nine six percent of the vote. Some unrealistic, like, oh yeah, we had air quotes elections. Exactly, yeah, and so people had had enough of that. And of course, what was also happening was in other countries that the tide was turning too. Poland had a democratic government already, first non communist government since May of that year. In the summer of that year, the Hungarians took down their borders. So now all of a sudden, East Germans had a route to get out of the Eastern Bloc. Hmm. If they could just get a holiday visa to Hungary, then they could skip across to Austria. Thousands were leaving. Then there was this whole thing that many of them basically went to the Czech Republic, climbed over the walls of the West German embassy in Prague, Mm. Or in Czechoslovakia, it was back then, and just camped out in the embassy. Yeah. So there were, you know, hundreds of them camped out in the embassy until some kind of arrangement was made to basically uh, get them transited by train out of Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. into West Germany. That's really interesting. I, I, I just recently had a conversation with a, a young woman who was explaining that when she was a kid, like mm -hmm. four or five years old, um, that she was with her mother and they, they went and camped in the lawn of the, the embassy there in Prague right, yeah. as a way to get away, like right there at the tail end of, of the, the GDR going on. That's So that's curious. There's there's some interesting sort of um, um, unintended consequences of that is that you can still, in some unrenovated buildings, they've often found that, that when someone's bought the building they want to renovate it and they've gone into the building 
and they've found a flat that's been locked since 1989. You know, the people just, mm. you know, locked, took the key and, and went to the Czechoslovakia. Mm. And you have a real snapshot of what that place looked wow, like in 1989. So, you know, the, the kind of items that they had on the shelves and all of those things. Yeah. There's been, I think, one or two sort of incidences of people just coming across apartments that have basically been locked since, uh, well, for 30 years now. Right, They're right. Pretty amazing. Those who were demonstrating here also made a very, very clear point that they said they weren't leaving. So there were two ways that you could protest. One was just to fuck off out of the country, and thousands were doing that. And others were saying, no, sod it, we're staying, we're going to reform the system, we are absolutely, this is our country, we want to, we want to make changes. And so um, once this demonstration in Leipzig happened, and it was clear that too many people were also leaving the country, Hungary was no support, the Russians weren't going to come with their tanks anymore, Poland was effectively a democratic state, um, it was clear even to the East German leadership that they had to they had to conduct some reforms. If they're mm-hmm. going to save the system, they had to conduct the reforms. Mm-hmm. And so Erich Honecker, who had been the sort of leader of East Germany for many, many years, uh, he was basically booted out. He was ousted and a new, a new leader came in and they started to reform uh, or they started to promise certain reforms. Mm-hmm. And then we fast forward to the, to the 9th of November. Right which is a fairly auspicious date in German history uh, because the 9th of November... It just a, keeps repeating itself, It just itself, keeps right? repeating itself. So many so things wild. happen on the 9th of November. Um, and this is one of the things where I love history, when something where a goof or a small insignificant thing can have such a massive impact on world history. I'm curious. I think I might you, know so what you, you're I don't, you know, to say. You may know that story. So the deal was that one of the things that people were, were, were asking for was the ability to travel. Yeah, the travel passes. Right, exactly. Yeah, I love this story. And too. it's such an amazing story. So what they decided was East German leadership was going to basically allow um, – uh, travel so people could travel they could yep. apply for a free permit to travel and they could go wherever they want there'd be no restrictions nothing travel passes will be approved exactly they will be approved <laughs> so they they have this press conference yeah and the guy says so this is the deal It's we, we've now decided that anybody in East Germany who wants to travel can basically do so yep and what he meant, of course, was that people had to go to the local authorities, get a stamp in their passport. It would be granted as a performer thing, but there still needed to be a bureaucratic step undertaken. Right. And somebody asked him, when would this new law come into f- effect? And he starts shuffling his papers and he says, well, as far as I know, right now. now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard another crazy uh, addendum or addition to that story in that this guy wasn't really an, an officer in the government. He was more of like a press. He was a press spokesperson. Uh, press yeah, spokesperson. Yeah, yeah he and was just reporting what someone else had decided. They were at the conference, like doing a regular press conference, and he was just handed this piece of paper. And that's possible, yeah. And got it and was like, oh, I'm getting this piece of paper now uh, from government officials that say like all of these uh, uh, travel passes will be approved. Yeah. And they're like, effective when? And he's like, Fuck no! It's <laughs> now it's not on this thing. Yeah, exactly. I, I guess now? Exactly. Yeah, basically, effective immediately, as I can tell uh, now. And of oh, course, man. and then you know, everyone watched that on the news, and anybody who's in East Berlin, you know, started flooding to the wall. Immediately, the grab your bug out bag, um, put your hat yeah, on, grab a yeah, jacket, and they went to the border. And the border guys didn't know what the fuck was going on. So we have yeah. another situation where they could have said, "Go pick, go fuck yourselves." But I think so. so Somebody high up decided or realized well, this was this would be really stupid if they actually stopped this and they opened the borders then. Well, and it was really interesting um, because the so and and I will say that the most the most in depth um, explanation that I've had of this uh, situation comes from a, a lecture that I was part and parcel to uh, producing, okay. which was a, a German, this was actually for the talks at Google program. Oh, so right. people yes. can go uh, onto YouTube and, and watch this presentation of a guy who was living outside of Berlin, um, who now works at Google in New York City and gave this presentation that. of his personal experience with that. Mm-hmm. And um, he had mentioned and, and talked about that it was the same kind of thing like what you were just mentioning with the uh, with the protest in Leipzig where these guys at the checkpoints the the guys at the border were calling the authorities and being like this group is getting bigger and bigger what do we do what do we do what do we do and, nobody and there was just no yeah. response yeah. and no answer yeah. and when these poor foot soldiers who are at checkpoint charlie like yeah they've got their rifle and maybe it's got you know 12 or 24 rounds in it or whatever maybe not even that much and you just have hundreds and hundreds of people exactly um there was a great photograph that was taken of like two uh 
East German guards at, I think, Checkpoint Charlie or near Checkpoint Charlie, just sitting on the ground with their rifles, like crying into their hands as people celebrate around them and they're like flooding out of the country. And it's just yeah. such an amazing failure of power structure. There's a lot of footage also of, you know, you know, civilians basically begging with them, you know, a woman also in tears saying, I've waited so long for this. You cannot deny me this mm -hmm. ability. Because, of course, particularly for Berliners, very much so for Berliners, the wall separated families. Right. Yeah, it's not. I mean, if, imagine if there was a wall that ran through Leipzig. We would have friends on both sides of the wall automatically mm -hmm. because we have friends all over town. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And and so that's exactly what happened to Berlin. And up until 1961, it was still possible for people to move between the East and the West. So you would certainly have East Berliners working in industries in the West and vice versa. And then quite literally overnight, it stopped. It ended. Mm hmm and there were some changes in the 70s that allowed sort of compassionate visits, particularly for older people could visit people in the West, uh, relatives. But for many people, there was that was 30 years or almost 40 years where they hadn't seen anybody. Well, and because the fear was that they would go to visit and then not Never come, come back, back, right? Exactly. And they needed the workforce. Exactly. They needed the Well, there the was a brain populace. drain. There was, yeah. there was a brain drain going on, of course, um, uh, in the 1950s. And that was one of the reasons why the war came up was because they were losing too many qualified people. Right. Definitely, yeah, gotta keep them in. So yeah, that was it. That was Crazy. that was that was how it how it happened. And then I think it was when was that? It was um, in March the following year. There was the first and only democratic elections held in the GDR. So the Volkskammer, the Chamber of People, if you mm -hmm. will, um, where the multi-party elections um, and many different parties were were represented, including sort of the sister parties of West German parties like the SPD and the CDU and so on, so on and so forth. And then of course the major debate um um started, so what happens? Do we do we continue as a separate independent state? Do we reunify with Germany? Mm. Uh with West Germany? Do we reunify with West Germany, but both countries are basically sort of give up their current uh, political structures and create something new? Mm. This, if you think the, in, the West German constitution is called a basic law, it's not called a constitution. The idea was that West Germany was a temporary construct. It was mm -hmm. going to be, they needed some kind of legislation to run, but they would actually, it would end when the whole of Germany reunited. I see. And what were the allies going to say? That was the other big thing because um, the post-war statutes meant that the final say on any German unification would be the four powers. So the French, the Russians, the British, and the Americans hmm. were the ones who had significant military presence in Germany, right. um, including sort of uh, legal jurisdiction over Berlin. Uh, were they going to be happy with Germany uniting? And not everybody liked the idea. Margaret Thatcher was very suspicious of a united Germany. The Russians, of course, didn't, you know, they had some mm. fairly ex unpleasant experiences. Well, but they would be on the losing Germany, end of a Germany, exactly. <laughs> so, so what happened then was the so-called four plus two talks that emerged then because uh, in West, Ger in, sorry, in East Germany, the parties that were in favor of reunification had won the election. So it was clear that most people wanted reunification mm. and there was a clear economic imperative. I mean, East Germany was busted. They had no money anymore. They yeah, were fucking bankrupt. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, one can understand that East Germans wanted to get their hands on the good stuff fast, fast, and they didn't really want to wait and have major philosophical debates about what kind of new state they wanted. They wanted a car, and they wanted to be able to travel, and they wanted a dishwasher, and so on and so forth. Mm. And it has been criticized quite a lot after the fact that people sort of lust for products, um, rushed them into a reunification that perhaps didn't work in their favor, but I can't say you can blame people. If you've been right. living in a system where you had don't have much, where there are very few prospects, where just consumer items, you know, some luxury items are just yep. not available or accessible, and all of a sudden you have 100 marks, every East German got 100 marks from the West German state, and you can spend it on whatever the fuck you like. You can understand why people would go for that. Yeah, certainly. Absolutely, you can understand that. So... um that happened throughout the sort of the spring and summer of 1990. There was a currency union, I think, that happened sometime. I'm not sure exactly when, in sort of late spring. So basically, the eastern mark and the western mark were unified. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the summer, there was a decision then for unification to happen. They sorted out the details with the allies. One of the major things was was getting the Russians to withdraw their troops because it was clear that. Um, 
it wouldn't be a unification of West Germany and East Germany as such, but it would be East Germany joining West Germany in all the structures that West Germany was a part of. So mm. NATO, the European Union, and sure. so on and so forth. And that was a big ask of the Russians. Is if you want to know why Putin is so pissed at you, one of the reasons <laughs> you gotta was let it go, guys. Na- well, yeah, but NATO. I mean, basically, the promise was made that NATO would not expand into the east. Right. So the Russians were asked to withdraw their troops, and I think by '92, the last Russian troops left East Germany. As far as I know, there was no NATO, and still isn't any NATO presence in this part of Germany. I don't know. I don't think so. I think there are certain NATO officers. But haven't we gone even into Poland at this point with NATO? Yes, I know, but that's true. We have for sure, absolutely. All of the Baltic states, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, basically there are half a dozen NATO states that border Russia, which is Mm. kind of part of the problem, Yeah, Mm. which is also why they're pissed. Yeah, because that that was a that was a violation of a promise that was made to them is that NATO would not expand east. And Putin's a dick. You're not going to get me to defend him in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but Russians have very very long memories, and one of the memories they have is the threats come from the West. Yeah, well, from Napoleon through to Hitler, Russia has to worry about the West. And so what they've dealt with that, how they've dealt with that, is to have a sort of a like a buffer of friendly states. Yeah to stop the enemy from attacking. Now NATO, which is definitely not a friend of Russia, is sitting on their doorstep and they're justifiably pissed. Anyway, that's a sidebar. So the 3rd of October was a fair, I'm not sure it was randomly chosen, but it's not a date that has any other significance as far as I can tell, whether that was just the most convenient date to choose, whether that was the first date that they could choose once all parties had ratified Mm. the reunification um, treaty, I don't know. But the reunification basically um, took effect on the 3rd of October, 1990. Hmm. And that's why we celebrate it as a national holiday in this country ever since. So so this year, not the big, this is year 29 of reunification. Of reunification, yeah. But it is the 30th anniversary of the wall. Of the wall coming down and the events that led to that. And Mm. certainly here in Leipzig, you will see any number. I mean, they have the Lichtfest every year. Did you go last year? Or was Uh, was it just before you'd arrived? I tried to get out and see some things, um, but didn't really manage to time it out properly. So I have have plans to do more more uh seeing that kind of site stuff uh this year so there's a festival of lights that takes place every year on the 9th of october on the augustus platz mm-hmm. um and it's literally just so they'll, they'll build up a stage in front of the opera and then they'll have the great and the good come and give speeches there'll be some music uh, music program and basically anybody who turns up can is given a light so you'll have like an audience of thousands of people holding lights mm-hmm. to symbolize the peaceful nature of the revolution and also to commemorate this extraordinary event on the 9th of October and then the big thing is the the um the big building the tall skyscraper next to the, the Gewandhaus this MDR building MDR building yeah. They they switch the lights on to to create an eight and a nine in oh. the lights of the windows. Mm. It's those nice little cutesy gimmicks that they do here, and it's it's a thing that Leipzigers like to do. You'll see lots and lots of people there. It's on the Augustusplatz in the evening of the 9th of October. Yeah, well, I'll go check that out. That Definitely. sounds real nice, actually. I'll be away on holiday then, otherwise I would have oh, joined you. I know. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll do. I'll, I'll sneak the flask out and I'll do shots in your honor. There you go. There you go. Uh, while while we're out there, yeah. well. So now, you know, flashing forward this this sort of uh, 30 or 29 years, uh, depending on where you want to draw your line, we, we find ourselves in another interesting sort of crossroads of time and history. You know, obviously, everything that's going on politically globally yeah. is very interesting. But uh, for the more direct impact, um, Germany also just went through its round of five-year elections. Is that correct? There, it's at every five years, right? Uh, this, the, the, the the national elections are every four years, but state elections, I think, oh, can did be I get every it wrong that it was four years? Um, I think so. I mean, states, uh, or is it state elections that are five different years? Different state elections are five years. Yeah, because I was looking at comparative numbers between this election in oh, right, twenty nineteen. Yeah. And the last election in 2014. Yeah, that. but those would have been state elections. Okay. Oh, you're looking at European elections there. Am I? Yeah. Oh, I thought this was... And they are every five years. Oh. There we go. European elections. Yeah. Oh, that's... that's not what I wanted to look at at all. <laughs> I wanted to look at Germany national. Because I was really excited. Well, it's the same thing. Now, this is European election results, but it's not European parliament. It's no, It's the German... It's the election results in Germany for the European parliament. I think. This is national national party, right? 
Yeah, the national parties still God competing. Damn it, I'm in the wrong elections. spot. Because <laughs> I got really excited because I saw this guy. Um, I wanted to bring up his name um, before I move away from Mr. Here. Sonnenbaum? No, Patrick Breyer, who okay. is the single and sole representative of the Piraten Party. Oh, right. The, the pirates, yeah. So he's a pirate. Yeah. So I, I want to meet this guy. Okay, we'll see Patrick, if we can get him on the show. Patrick. If you're listening. Be guest. <laughs> Come on the show. I want to <laughs> figure out what you're all about. Yeah. All right. So this is not the results that I wanted because um, actually this doesn't look terrible to me. No. Because um, this shows about 28% for the CDU and then and 20% the for the Green. But yeah. this is not the, the state elections. No. That that, I was those looking are the European for. elections. That so were what, do you, what can you tell me about the, the state elections that just took place? Okay. Um, well, we have the AfD. We've talked about these fuckers on the show before, I think. Here, yeah, They are a right. far-right party. Right. Uh, they are now represented in every German state, and they're also represented on a national level. Mm-hmm. Um, so think the left wing of the Republican Party, <laughs> if there is such a thing. The left wing of the Republican Party. <laughs> Wait a minute. How I does are... that work? How is the AfD the left wing of the Republican Party. Because everything in the United States is far right. I would call the Democrats like the CDU. I mean, seriously? Yeah. Yeah, I, the I kind can of see things, how they're The centrist. kind of thing I mean, that, that, the... that drives Fox News into an absolute tizzy, like universal health care. You know, even arch conservatives in this country would say, well, yeah, of course we have universal health care. Yeah, no, they've what absolutely... Is. They have absolutely... Um, but see, I'm seeing the same results here. This is but the this same is thing. This is a federal. Okay, so you, oh no, it says European no, no, Parliament no, no, no. elections. Look, 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 look. So you got Europe. You've got Bundestag elections, and maybe this is uh, what I'm, not but the that's, Parliament. But that's the Parliament. That the last. That was two years ago. The last elections. <sighs> I'm wondering if they have state elections. Or you'd this probably what I was have looking to go, for. This is annoying. Um, I thought I was there. What's going on, Germany? How come I can't find your election results? They're what are you hide- trying to hide? They're hiding it. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, we anyway, big reveal, big reveal. <laughs> the There were elections held in the states of Brandenburg and Saxony, Saxony, the state that we live in. Oh, is that why I'm getting it wrong? I should just look up Saxony? Maybe. Uh, I yeah. think so, because Saxony, yeah. the Saxony Here returning officer. Okay, there we go. Far right. Oh, yeah, so the AfD basically... Um, there was a real fear, particularly in Saxony, that they were initially polling to become the strongest party in Saxony. Oh, good Lord, 27.5%. And uh, and you just mentioned just how much they got. Ugh. So that's that's over a quarter of, of the votes in uh, Saxony went to a far-right party. And that's got everybody... Um, in a bit of a spin about whether democracy is dying a death in Germany. What and goes whether, on? Yeah, yeah. And whether... Um, we need to worry. And many West Germans have um, tried to make the argument that this has to do with a lack of um, democratic understanding or sort of democratic intuition in East Germany because they've only had 30 years of, um, of elections, whereas the democratic structures run much deeper in the West. So the argument goes. And yes, the AfD does score higher in East German states, particularly in Saxony. Um, but it's also worth remembering that the AfD is represented in every single state, including, mm. you know, well-established, comfortable, democratic West German states like um, Nordrhein-Westfalen. So it, it's a little bit, it's it's too simplistic in my view to mm. say that it's just East Germans don't get democracy and that's why they're voting for a party that is clearly anti-democratic. That can't be right. It can't be right. I think there are, there are a number of factors. There is, um, there is certainly the factor that there is a racism problem in this state. This is a state that is um, center-right, so it's been ruled by the CDU since reunification. Mm. Um and I would say it's sort of the CDU that runs Saxony is certainly sort of on the right wing of the CDU. So these are, you know, very sort of laissez-faire, not very very proud of Saxony, not great with integration of people coming from the mm-hmm. outside. There's been a long-running concern that the police in Saxony are uh, are somewhat blind to right-wing crimes. And so there are gro- there has been growth of right-wing organizations within Saxony, also right-wing terror organizations that have been allowed to flourish 
for too long without mm. the police or the uh, security services getting involved. I've also heard a lot of grumbling. And again, this is just people talking. Uh, so please, listeners, don't take this as an assertion of fact or anything like that. But I have heard a lot of, of speculation or grumbling that maybe um, some of these uh, f- more far-right extremists and sort of nationalist extremists are actually using the police departments as a way in. To oh, absolutely. Power. Oh, there's, there's... Which is kind of happening in some places in the United States to where, they, like, neo-Nazis and white supremacists are like, oh, we can't walk around in jackboots and lynch black people, but what we can do is go through police officers training school and become cops and then, you know, legally beat people of color which is really fucked up but it's really fucked up oh there, there's been a, a long-standing concern that there are sympathizers within the police force who um who are who are passing on information to to right-wing right extremist organizations what was that whole list news story that just came up right um which i'm not going to be able that? to talk about it very well because i it completely gapped my mind but there was this whole thing where they had compiled a list Mm. they were using police resources to compile lists of like protesters and Mm. far leftist people like all the way down to their phone numbers and their house addresses oh yes absolutely that's terrifying yeah so it doesn't help that then if the authorities are creating an atmosphere where it's okay to be uh, to be a dick to be sort of you know anti-foreigner and sort of anti-authority then of course if these things are allowed to flourish then they will mm. if people understand that they can get away with being assholes and they will this is no different than in the UK or the United mm. States mm-hmm. we've always got racist pricks everywhere but in the old days they they mostly kept their opinions to themselves or they were a sort of a fringe organization because the 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 response that they were getting if they ever went public with that was so overwhelmingly negative that they knew there was no traction. Right. That's changing. Yeah. It's now becoming more acceptable. People aren't so shocked anymore. And there might also be some tacit encouragement going mm. on when somebody, Zeke Hiles, I mean, we, we had a friend, you were talking about Yesterday. That. Exactly. I was there. Her yeah. and I were walking together. So my friend Yulia and I were walking together. I was going to bring this up, but I was trying to find the the right well, uh, I gave it to you opportunity there, yeah. to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we were walking down the street uh, the other day, and um, there were two later middle-aged men outside of a consume having their, you know, afternoon beer or who knows what number of beer it was. But as we walked by, out of nowhere, this guy screams at the both of us. Um, a, a nice big Heil Hitler uh, gave the salute and then added on an addendum of a "Yeah, baby." <laughs> Which was the the most confusing part of it. And I still can't properly process why it happened or like what was the cause for it. And Yulia's suggestion to me was that perhaps by the way that I was dressed, I looked a little too Antifa. Uh, And and he was like, oh, I'm going to take an opportunity to yell at this guy because... I don't know. I had my black hoodie on and my black uh, oh, you're you definitely know, uh, head cap and my my sort of military green pants or whatever. Like maybe I look, but then as I walked and I thought about it, um, I was like, maybe he didn't see me as Antifa. Maybe he saw me as a brother, a brother, because I do. You know, my hair's cut pretty short, and I was wearing like military pants and carrying a military backpack. And you have a slight Nordic look to you. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty pale. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I was really confused by it, and then also just really, really taken aback by the, the situation of, uh, and I hate to use this word, but emboldenment. Yeah, that this guy did not hesitate no. at all to no. consider who we were. He he just threw that right yeah. out there without any concern for consequences. But that's and, exactly the problem. If you go to any of these sort of major demonstrations where where far right parties or neo Nazi parties are marching, you will see these things happening regularly, and the police does too little to actually intervene. So giving the Nazi salute is illegal in this country. Mm-hmm. Wearing Nazi symbology is illegal in this country. Uh, you know, Zeke Heiling, like this guy was doing, is absolutely illegal in this country. Um, and if people are doing this openly at a demonstration where there are thousands of police officers around, you would reasonably expect them to march in and collar the guy. Yeah. And that does it does happen, but not as much as it should. And that's also then, if you're being emboldened, if you can Zeke Heil in front of a goddamn police officer and get away with it, yeah, then why and other people see you do that? Then of course people are going to become more emboldened. Yeah, two in the afternoon in front of a consume, you're not worried exactly. in the, uh, exactly. at all. Yeah, I get. It. I was just so 
surprised and taken aback by it and wasn't really paying attention. But the more I think about it in retrospect, the more I kind of wish I had punched that guy in the face. Well, where um, just like that's also illegal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, but uh, but to. I just can't fathom it. I can't wrap my brain around. Yeah, what's but you were so just so on. surprised by that. You were kind of taken aback. You know, you have to. It's not something you expect. Well, it's and you a, don't get like like. I think one of the most confusing things about it was the sort of Austin Powers English uh, addendum. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah baby. baby. <laughs> and I was just like, wait, how? Like, did you? Could you tell that I could speak English? Like, how does that even? Well, if he, I don't even if he was on this. his fifteenth beer, he might not have even noticed he was saying that. Mm. So it could have also just you were just randomly chosen as people walking by, and he felt now would be a good time to see God. Yeah, I might as well just throw this out there yeah, and, and see because ah, my damn. impulse control is shot to shit. But what? But but what goes on? Like, what is this? Um, there, like one of the things I was looking at this, uh, article talking about the, the AFD and it's like, there are two big protests coming up are about, you know, um, the sort of, uh, anti-immigration, anti-change, yeah. like closed minded uh, thing. And then the other one is like, they want to shut down coal mines because it's bad for the environment. And those two things kind of seem at odds to me. But so, at the same time, it's like, like what what goes on that makes this an appealing mindset to have again for people specifically? Let's talk about Saxony, which seems to be having this sort of swing back from whatever it was, eleven percent in the last elections to now over twenty five percent. Exactly. Like, what's going on? Well, I think there's there's one phenomenon is simply this um, kind of understandable, but also utterly ludicrous. Um, no uh, sort of correlation between places that have very few foreigners but very, very high anti-foreigner sentiment. Mm. So in you don't have the AfD is not strong in Berlin. The sure. AfD is not strong in Frankfurt. Oh, it's not strong here in Leipzig. It's not strong here in Leipzig either. So in the big cities where if you were really anti-foreigner, this would be the place where you go, well, those fuckers are everywhere. Those are the places where you're not voting AfD because mm. people can see them up close and personal and they understand that there's nothing wrong with having foreigners. They actually are a benefit and a, a huge boon to society. Mm. So it's 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 these these, you know, these podunk towns where people sleep with their cousins where where this is <laughs> this is very much Saxony has its version of Mississippi as sure, well. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um <laughs> and <laughs> um the other thing that is, and I know this is a theory of mine that's shared by some, but it might be fun to actually get, you know, a political scientist actually in on the show to give it a bit more insight. Reunification, I would say, by and large, has been beneficial to West, to East Germany in the sense we, sure. we if we look in the city and we see how many buildings have been renovated, how many motorways, uh, railway systems have been re redone, all of that, it's pretty spectacular. But it hasn't benefited everybody. Mm-hmm. And what happened was um, when Germany reunified, all of Germ most of Germany's industry and huge amounts of East Germany, sorry, East Germany's industry, East Germany's in, uh, real estate was state owned. Mm. So that was given over then to um, a, a government trust. Hmm. So a West German government trust was set up that became basically the administrator and the owner of all of this industry. And they went full neoliberalism on that. So they stripped most of these industries for parts. They shut down anything that wasn't super profitable. And they streamlined the fuck out of everything in East Germany, mm. which made sense from an economic point of view. The reason why East Germany was, was bust was because they were manufacturing shit that nobody wanted. Right. But you if know, you're an assembly line lives, worker. Right. You lost your job. Mm. And what else are you going to do? And for many mm. of these people, they weren't. There was skilled labor. But they were skilled labor in building tractors or skilled labor in, in heavy industry or in the mines that we have sure. outside the city. And so there's a tractors that still run today, by the way. Yeah. I'll just, let, let's not even go there. But I know, but but it, nobody wants to buy that. You know, it, I mean Leipzig had a had a computer, an IT industry. Yeah. But how is East Germany's IT going to compete against the Japanese or West Germany sure. or Sweden? Yeah, the joke about there was a joke um, floating around in East Germany that Rubertron, which was the state-owned East German sort of a high-tech company, yeah, mm -hmm. 
was set to build the largest microchip in the world. <laughs> that was their... <laughs> so people lost jobs. Thousands, tens of thousands of people lost their jobs. There was a phenomenal amount of money that was poured into retraining. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a whole generation, I would say, that was really fucked by reunification. If you were my age or younger, you would you were still in school during reunification, so you then got to train and go to college under the new system and then, you know, become part of this new high-tech late 20th century age that everybody was enjoying. Mm. If you were in your sort of late 50s, early 60s, then you were pretty close to retirement. And then you got a pretty sweet deal because you got an East German pension Mm. that was being paid in Deutschmarks. So adjusted, you would get, you know, you could retire with a West German Mm -hmm. adjusted pension, but still East German uh, cost of living. But for those who are in their 30s and 40s... forgotten generation. Exactly. These were the ones who still had a good 20 years, maybe 30 years of, of, of working life ahead of them, but maybe just too old to actually retrain. You know, it, it, these guys grew up speaking Russian, and now they were in a, in a world where English was almost an essential thing mm-hmm. for any meaningful job. So um, um, Katja, the mother of my kids, she's, she's had lots of work basically training guys in English English, IT, there were IT courses, but if you've never really worked with a computer ever in your life, Mm -hmm. this is also a big ask for somebody who's in their 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And so for many of these guys, um, the reunification was good from a material level, but they couldn't quite benefit from it because they weren't getting jobs. So some of these people were basically long-term, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years unemployed. That can really fuck your dignity as well. Too young to retire, too old to rapidly adapt and left out of the changing system. And, and of course, uh, there was the the greater phenomenon. So cities like Dresden and Leipzig and, to a lesser extent, Chemnitz, if we're talking about Saxony, Saxony, of course, did benefit because international companies did set up uh, uh, business here. We have here in Leipzig DHL. Their entire European operations Mm -hmm. is based in Leipzig because we have an airport and we are – very well situated on the on the highway system. But once you get out of town, yeah, so if you're driving 20 kilometers into the boonies, there's nothing, mm. absolutely fucking nothing. So the countryside got deserted. Yeah, schools started to close. Mm. The one or two businesses that might have been the only employees in the region shut down because they could no longer compete. Um there was a there was a flight of young people. So anybody who wanted to actually get jobs would go to West Germany. So in the in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties, thousands upon thousands of people from East Germany were leaving to get work in West Germany because hmm. that's where the work was. So then there was a generational problem where you only had old people living in these places, and then you also have to because of course government amenities like schools and hospitals and roads and what have you, they are based on a census. So a planner will look and say, okay, we've got X number of kids in this region. It needs a school or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Are we going to build a hospital here or are we going to build a hospital over there? And all of a sudden, you know, the the hospital that used to be in your town has now been shifted 20 kilometers away, but you're a 70-year-old person who doesn't have a car Mm. and there's one bus that goes to the big town every day. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't and look And this so resent so these were forgotten regions. There were so many regions, particularly in Saxony, that just fell off the map. Huh. Yeah. And I think that's something that the RFD was able to tap into quite successfully by saying, Well, those fuckers up in Berlin and those fuckers in Dresden and you know, they don't give a shit about you. Uh, but we give a shit about you. And then, of course, they were able to then take it one step further and say, look at all these Syrians coming here. The government right. cares about them, obviously. They're getting housing. They're getting blah, blah, blah. So you can see how the narrative gets spun. Yeah, of course. I mean, Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a whole bunch of racist assholes out there. And there are. I would right. say a lot of them are racist assholes. And I still would have a major problem if I discovered that one of my friends voted for the IFD. Because I would say, is you really in this country, is your knowledge of history so limited that you would vote for a party that is actively using the vocabulary of the Nazis? Right. Yeah? I don't give a shit. Your grievances might be legitimate, but voting for the IFD is not going to get you anywhere. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that's my theory. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it mirrors and aligns with a lot of what's going on, you know, in the United States and a yeah. lot of other places as well. It, I guess in the Western world, it's kind of, colloquially stated that like nostalgia runs on a 20-year cycle 
Okay. And maybe the whole, you know, delayed period of time pushes that to a 30 year cycle when you're talking about this sort of nostalgia Perhaps. for the way things used to be. Perhaps. And then, uh, like what you said with the, the whole racism thing as well, it reminds me of having a chat with uh, our friend Steph on the way to Czech Republic sure. uh, a couple weeks ago. Where we were riding through like the wine uh, producing regions over here, and there's mountains and streams, and it's so beautiful and so quaint and so quiet. And these are the ones that tend to be these hotbeds for for very close minded racism. Absolutely, and it's not impossible to rationalize how they got there. No, right? Where you're like, hey, we really like what we had um, our entire lives, and then that was kind of abruptly put asunder and everything changed but it didn't really impact us too much we still have this idyllic landscape and we can still make wine and we still have tourism and everything's still pretty good but we don't want that to go away so when the other starts to arrive we're gonna get really pearl clutchy and and like oh we don't want anything to change because it already changed once and we didn't like that so we don't want that again so you see a brown person and it's like oh no we have to protect our beauty and and natural state of thing and it's like Okay, I mean, I get how you connected those dots to get there. You're completely and totally wrong yes. and misguided. Sure. But it's not impossible to at least follow the wacky logic. No, no, no. It, it's not at all. Uh, I mean, it's the the grievances that some of these regions have are legitimate. They really are legitimate. I mean, some of the regions. So, for example, here, um, brown coal is being but there are a couple of brown coal stations that are being kept alive. One here outside of Leipzig, and I think one sort of uh, uh, towards the Czech border. Um, but that meant a whole industry died almost overnight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so all the people working in it had to find jobs elsewhere. Now it was it was obviously it's a good thing that we don't mine brown coal anymore. It's right. dirty. It's shitty. It pollutes. It's awful stuff. Thank God we don't do that anymore. What do we do with the people who actually yeah. earn their living in that? Not yeah. everyone can become an IT specialist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, what what got forgotten. And there was the the way that also the West German state rode roughshod over some of the industries, uh, I think, is something that hasn't been fully acknowledged and fully um, um, uh, accepted that that was a mistake. There were some industries here, I think, in Leipzig. Uh, one of my students did a research project on that, where the um, some factories, the employees were offering to buy the factory mm. and run it as a cooperative. Mm. Where they were saying to the to the trust, they were saying, "We think this thing has future. Mm. We think we can make this work. We know how this business works. Right? So give it back to us. Give it back to us. We will run it as a cooperative enterprise." And I think there were one or two cases where that happened. They also proved to be quite successful. Mm. But in most cases, they just they they sold it off. Yeah. They, they they just made a quick buck off it. And well, and if it was it. redundant, they would probably be telling themselves like, "Oh, we don't need you to be making cars here but because we make owned, cars over yeah, here." But if or it's whatever. owned by the yeah, employees exactly. in a free market, they'll sink or swim. Right. Yeah. I mean that yeah, they yeah, they understood that by taking it on, they were responsible for its success or not. But they right. they felt they could do that. They felt they could adapt the product that it would still be marketable and still actually be. That people would want to have it, um, but there there were too often cases of then the powers that be saying, "Nah, it's not going to happen. We're just going to take the industry and flog it." Huh. Crazy. Yeah, it's really so. There's still work to be done. There's there's a report that gets issued every year. There's there's a government representative for the East, and he just recently published a report where he said things are definitely improving, but there was a recognition certainly of things that uh, needed to improve. So, for example, there is not one single major German company that has its headquarters here in the East. Hmm. Uh, there is not a single Eastern company that is listed in the top 50 uh, stock market um, exchange list. So, the, the top 50 of the Börse, not one of them are from East Germany. Yeah. The only major success story for East Germany is is the Zec, the Wurtkäppchen. <laughs> yeah. They bought up the West German, I think, uh, which was Mum, I think they bought up the West German um, Zec company Mum. But other than that, wow. it's still uh, the, the economy is still in West Germany. Hmm. That's really interesting. So I think nowadays there is still some cultural separation 
uh, where East Germans and West Germans sort of look at each other slightly weirdly. And certainly when I first moved to Leipzig, friends were amazed that I moved to Leipzig. They didn't understand that. And mm. when they came to visit, they would say, wow, this is incredible here. And I would sort of very yeah. sarcastically say, yes, we have lighting and running water and you know, <laughs> traffic lights and all the rest of that. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I think now we're at the stage where basically it's 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 an urban versus rural problem, as it is, of course, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, but of course, places like Saxony and Brandenburg in particular have a shitload of rural Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. they they have really a lot of countryside where mm. where the economy just isn't really working. Yeah. Well, the last thing I I, I will say about this uh, election situation is is one thing that I really always look at in in elections, especially being from the United States. And I gotta again commend, no matter how the results shook out, I gotta commend the people because the turnout of voters was I, I have it written down here that it was 61 percent mm -hmm. of people living in saxony turned out to vote in the in the state election that's and right that's phenomenal and most because, people voted for other parties yeah there was a lot of other stuff that went on a lot of green mm. uh, of course you know cdu still got its uh, majority support and everything that's right. like that um but the the linka and the you know the green party is having this big like oomph behind it but Coming from a, a country that regularly has voter turns out turnouts in the twenties, uh -huh. it's nice to see like more than half people turning yes. up. And then the the statistic um, that I found of that was in the in a few years ago, the voter turnout was actually below fifty percent. So something has spurned people, and you almost have to assume that it's younger people. Yes, to I get out so. there and make their voices heard, and I exactly. think we see that in these Fridays for the Future marches that we've been talking about. Yeah, um, this big climate uh, National Day of Climate Awareness that just happened, That's and the, right. the successful turnout of that was m majority young people as well. So it gives a lot of hope that this. Um, this cycle of nostalgia or whatever it might be that's sort of pulling these areas back, uh, back into the, to the dark ages. Um, Maybe it doesn't have a that long of a life compared to this new. Fingers crossed. We can't yeah. be complacent, but I'm not. I'm not terrified yet. I think there's still plenty of people out there, you know, trying to fight this this trend and trying to alert people that the AfD is not the solution mm -hmm. for anybody, including the people who vote for it. Yeah, but that's a, that's the biggest trick. It's and not. if we can figure out how to do that here, then maybe I can export some of that back to the United States. Well, we'll we'll offer that to you free of charge. Yeah, well, <laughs> I hope they'll buy it, no matter what the cost. There you go. Hey, thanks so much, man. Cheers. Let's polish Shit, these, uh, these nice cocktails yeah. off here while we wrap up the show. Uh, again, thanks to Leipzig Spirituoso and Manufacturer for this goddamn lovely gin. It's so delicious. Um, sip it. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's really nice. So good. And again, bring back the dot com. Shot at that dot com. Find everything there. Patreon.com slash shot at that to support. That's it. There we go. That's all I got to say. What are we going to do next? Oh, next week we have Inno and Max stopping by the studio to actually, uh, from Leipzig uh, Spiritualism Manufacturer, to talk about their distilling process and all that fun stuff. So that should be a good show. And I imagine we get a little bit tipsy in that regard. So, I, Justin, I hope, I hope so. you'll be back to join. Oh, yeah. All right, man. We'll see you all then.